evening. The Bill of Rights is one of the most special documents, not only in American history, but in the history of the world. It establishes some very wonderful new principles in addition to continuing other noble principles. When our country was founded, the founders wanted to establish a constitution. A bone of contention was the Bill of Rights. There was fierce debate whether it should be included or not. Some people just wanted the Constitution to go through without the hassle of the Bill of Rights. George Washington was one of these people. Others believed the Bill of Rights was absolutely necessary to be established. First, the Constitution was ultimately passed. Then, the Bill of Rights was tacked on. They're called the first ten amendments. Amendments implies to add on. If you would like to find out more about how the Bill of Rights came into existence, you should read the books written by Seth Jeffrey St. John about our country's founding. Fortunately, there is a broad range of people who encourage awareness about our constitutional rights. These range for the most reactionary to the rebels. When I went to high school in Illinois, we had a certain requirement. In order to pass government class, you needed to pass a constitution test. In order to pass high school, you needed to pass government class. Thus, in order to pass high school, you had to pass a constitution test. I find this requirement to be a good one. What else could be more important than having understanding about our Constitution and especially its rights. Some, such as the ACLU, encourage us to be aware of our rights. order that they may be preserved. An old friend of mine named Jeff Decker was one of the people who most promoted awareness of rights. He studied the matter. He exercised his rights, including defending himself in court. He passed out handouts about our rights. Sadly, not very many people care. He also had a radio program where he discussed our constitutional rights, particularly as they relate to the powers of police. I, being inspired by him, also have wanted to educate myself and others about our criminal rights our constitutional rights. I have read the No Low Press Criminal Law Handbook. I recommend this book to anyone who wants a great discussion about what specifically we are granted under the Bill of Rights. Tonight, I would like to discuss what the Bill of Rights is all about. I would like 
to present these amendments, it's good to be reminded. I also would like to share some insight of my own plus the insight of others. At the end, I would like to present a story of my life involving the First Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, the Sixth Amendment, if not other amendments. Some contend the issue of constitutional rights is very relevant today considering the creation of such documents as the Patriot Act. I currently am in the process of reading this document. I believe it's valuable to do that. I hear some senators and Congress people have not even read the document. Therefore, it really puts us ahead of the game if we can read it. Hopefully, fairly soon, I can get through it all. The Patriot Act is claimed by opponents to take away some of our precious rights. Thus, naturally, they argue we need to oppose it. That brings up the bigger question of being aware of our rights. That is why we are here tonight, folks. The First Amendment to the Constitution is perhaps my favorite. It guarantees freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of assembly, the right to petition the government for redress of grievances also guarantees freedom of religion. Since I am a very expressive person, since my existence is founded upon expression, I love this amendment. I cannot imagine living without it. There was a woman I knew in college who told me a great saying. She said, democracy is like a muscle. If you don't use it, it goes away. If we replace democracy with freedom, we get to the most important matter. Freedom is like a muscle. If you do not exercise, it goes away. Therefore, if we do not exercise our First Amendment rights, they may go away. Those who exercise the rights the most value them the most. Few organizations are as open-minded or as are as expressive as this organization. Few organizations utilize their First Amendment rights to the fullest the way we do. Thus, this organization, by exercising these rights, are ensuring the preservation of these rights. I believe rights are intrinsically rewarding to assert. These rights are not merely for ends, though they certainly can be used to serve ends, but in and of themselves they are good to be used. They're good for actualization, they're good for the joy they Fortunately, the First Amendment over the years has relatively remained intact. 
There's been a stall, but it still has stayed strong. The fact that this amendment, along with the other amendments, have generally stayed intact over the years despite assaults from judges, cops, and others is a testament to the great power of this document. No stupid judge, no rotten cop has been able to abolish the Bill of Rights yet. There are a few limits to the First Amendment. For example, you cannot use speech which you are fully aware such speech would be libelous or slanderous. You cannot make up lies about someone just because you do not like them. I do wonder how sometimes this principle is noble, but it cannot prevent, prevent illogic from reigning. For example, lots of people claim that anyone that if you criticize the president, particularly in regard to the war effort in the Middle East today, you support Saddam Hussein. Most people I know who criticize the president do not support Saddam Hussein. Big country ban got horrible assault. I don't particularly care for this ban, but I have to emphasize with it because they were attacked relentlessly, maliciously for a relatively mild comment. One of their members said, Bush makes me ashamed to be from Texas. This was twisted into an anti truth statement. So it doesn't make any sense to me. Plus all these people who said she supported Saddam Hussein because she said that, in my book, are guilty of libel and slander if they are bright enough to realize what they are, what they are doing. is false and wrong. They're doing it just for their own political gain. It's bad. Some people are just stupid enough to believe it. Our former governor in Minnesota said you cannot legislate stupidity. Perhaps he's right. The courts have also ruled you cannot use fighting speech. You cannot say something to provoke a violent reaction from someone. I'm not so sure about this. This type of thinking seems to me to make someone criminally responsible for the way someone else reacts to them. Though this hasn't been abused in major ways, the way it exists is seriously flawed. Some, such as Freedom from Religion Foundation, contend we need absolute separation between church and state. Others say it's not freedom of religion, it's not freedom from religion, it's freedom of religion, claiming People have the right to practice what they want, but it's okay for religion to get involved in the government. The Second Amendment 
to the Constitution is the famous right to bear arms. We hear debate over this amendment all the time. It's common knowledge we have such a debate. Sometimes I hear the debate boils down to a punctuation mark. Is there a semicolon there or not? Thus, next time your English teacher professor seems to nitpicky with your use of punctuation, ponder the potential ramifications that can result if you're sloppy. to the Constitution is perhaps the least timely, the least relevant, the least important. Rights are generally very important. Thus, even though this one is important, it's not as immediately important as most of the rest. Once upon a time, it was very important. But today, we don't have the same situation. This amendment prohibits homeowners from being forced to quarter troops during times of peace, during times of war, only to be prescribed by law. For the longest time, we have not fought major portions of wars on American soil. Thus, that part alone would perhaps make the amendment not as relevant. It is also not standard practice to house troops in private homes. We have sophisticated architecture, sophisticated buildings all over the place. There is no great need to house them in private homes. Back in the day, it was standard practice to do this. The British government would require the colonists to house their troops. The colonists didn't like this. I heard the troops did not have good manners. Even if they had impeccable manners, it still would not be a good deal. It is one's own home. Don't they have the right to say who can and cannot come there? Perhaps this amendment led to the same one's home as one's castle. One has the right to keep whoever they want in their own private sanctuary or refuse admittance in their private sanctuary. It is good this amendment is there just in case. Maybe in the future some situation will develop which will make this immediately relevant. The Fourth Amendment to the Constitution prohibits unreasonable search and seizure. It demands a search warrant or at least probable cause in order for a private citizen to be searched. The search warrant must be signed by a judge or magistrate. I like this amendment. I try whenever possible to tell police officers, no! I'm not going to let you search. They, of course, do not like it, but that's too bad. Sometimes they get the attitude, you have nothing to hide. You would not mind us searching. The great response to that is, if you had a good reason to search, you could procure a search warrant. So shut up! They do not like the Fourth Amendment. What they need to do is take the first flight to North Korea. Or shut They need to do that. The Fifth Amendment and the 
sixth amendment are related. They both pertain to courts and trials. The fifth amendment grants the right to a grand jury indictment for felonious federal offenses. Also, it mandates due process for both one's liberty and one's property to be taken away. It prevents double jeopardy. It also ensures one the right to refuse to issue testimony that would incriminate oneself during a court trial. These are crucial amendments. I hear these rights emanated from the British system. The British were doing something right too. Their whole innocence to prove guilt is of course a pillar of our criminal justice system too. Some of the Fifth Amendment I hear they were not practicing to the fullest. Which also relates to the Sixth Amendment, which I plan to get into shortly. It is important to have due process. This way the government cannot take away your liberty or property without going through the proper procedures, without hopefully having some fairness in the process. What is tricky about rights is evildoers are like viruses. They find ways around it. These costly judges cannot directly violate your rights, but they find ways around it. Just as the Ku Klux Klan has. Back in the day, laws were passed which said you cannot discriminate at the polls based on race. The Klan, being the virus they are, found ways around that. They required poll taxes, literacy tests. On the surface, they were not directly discriminating based on race, but in actuality, they were. Double jeopardy is the same way. They cannot try you for a federal murder for the same person two times. But what they can do is try you for slightly different crimes or try you for different counts of the same crime. Maybe, they, maybe you committed 12 acts of battery. They try you for six. You're put in a six, they try you for the other six, even though it's one incident. There's ways around rights. Lots of people do not like rights, but they are determined to find ways around them. The grand jury indictment one is also the same situation. One famous saying by a legal professional is grand juries are so stacked in favor of the prosecution that any competent prosecutor could indict a ham sandwich. No press criminal law handbook talks about how badly grand jury indictments are. They say almost always they get an indictment. They say basically the grand jury is a rubber stamp for the prosecutor to go ahead. There's a right on paper, but in any important sense, it has lost its meaning. 
and legitimacy when any prosecutor can indict a ham sandwich. Noble Press also talks about how restricted one's rights are to a grand jury. You have different rights in regard to a grand jury than you do during the criminal trial itself. Sixth Amendment is a continuation of the rights in the Fifth Amendment. Sixth Amendment guarantees you the right to a speedy public trial for the impartial jury. Also gives you the right to call witnesses on your behalf, to confront your accusers, guarantees your right to the assistance of counsel plus the right to be notified of the exact nature of the crime of which you are accused. The speedy public trial is vital. They cannot hold you in prison indefinitely. There are very strict guidelines that have been developed with how quickly it must proceed. Otherwise, they could just say, maybe if we feel like it, 30 years, 40 years, we may put you on trial for shoplifting. The public part is important too. Public trials, anyone can see if the judge or the prosecutor is out of line. Everyone can see that. They can get irate if they are smart enough to do so. Also, this can turn itself around because people can also see the defendants too. And the defense. Some law, defense lawyers are unbelievable. People can see that too. I have heard there's great controversy over whether allowing television cameras in the courtroom is truly granting a fair trial. The bill of particulars is important. In order for you to defend yourself, it's very helpful to understand what specific laws you are violating. Calling witnesses on your behalf is, is incredibly important. When you do this, you're allowed to make your case stronger. If you could not do that, it would all be stacked against you. This is why grand jury indictments are so stacked. Because you cannot issue evidence on your own behalf. All you can do is refute any questions the prosecutor may have of you if they choose to have you testify before a jury. Confronting your accusers is extremely vital. When you have this opportunity, you can poke holes in what they're saying. If they are saying something that's illogical, that's plain out false, you have the right to ask questions which makes their account seem suspect. Assistance of counsel is, of course, vital. We are granted the right to a lawyer. The lawyer can defend you, help you out. If you also choose, you have the right to be your own lawyer. I love that right. In the Chicago 8 trial, Bobby Seale 
got very angry because he felt the judge was denying him his Sixth Amendment right. His first lawyer, Charles Gary, fell ill during the trial. He had to get a major surgery. He could not actively represent Seal. Seal then said, I want to represent myself until or if Gary can represent me. The judge said, no. William Kutzler is there to represent you. Seal said, no, I don't want him to represent me. The judge said, he issued papers on your behalf. He's your lawyer. Take it. Thus, so many of the contempt citations, as one book pointed out, in that trial, stand from Bobby Seal saying, I want my Sixth Amendment rights. You're denying my Sixth Amendment rights. He is very, very persistent. I have read the contempt citations of this trial. There's one book that compiled all of them. In the process, I discovered some of the other defendants were perhaps unreasonable in their conduct. But I reinforced my belief Bobby Seale's conduct was perfectly justified. This clearly illustrates how they can take away your rights. Also, you have the right to confront your accusers issue, call witnesses on your own behalf. But the judge can just, if you have some great point of some witness, they can find some excuse to deny that witness. Therefore, you lose out. The Seventh Amendment to the Constitution guarantees jury trials in civil matters above $20. Today, in virtually every civil, every substantial civil matter, we have the right to a trial by jury. Since civil trials have both a plaintiff and a defendant, either party may elect to have a jury trial. One wants it, they both get it. The Eighth Amendment to the Constitution prohibits excessive bail being imposed, also cruel and unusual punishment for being enacted. You cannot be thrown in jail for $5 million bail for stealing 50 cents pack of baseball cards. That's clearly unreasonable. You probably think that never happens if you think that you're wrong. Maybe not that exaggerated, but it does happen. Excessive bail is imposed often. In Philadelphia, four years ago, during the Republican National Convention, some protesters were held in jail. I heard one lawyer talk in Philadelphia about the situation. He said the fact they were holding these defendants on, in some cases, $1 million bail, $500,000 bail for misdemeanors was unprecedented. Later, I heard the city ended up dismissing most, if not all, of the charges. My belief is, in order of increasing sense, there is the cops, the prosecutors, the judge. The cops are so dumb, so unreasonable, they impose 
this fail? If my information is correct, the prosecutor dismissed the charge. That proves they're more sensible than the cops. Sometimes it gets to the judge. Sometimes the judge is sensible, sometimes not. Cruel and unusual punishment is also important. At first glance, one may think, does it really matter if punishment is unusual? Certainly, unusual punishment does not necessarily have to be cruel. I hear about some creative punishments which are probably way less cruel than usual punishment. Most of us think cruel punishment is bad. Perhaps what the framers of our Constitution were thinking, unusual punishment can be cruel punishment, not necessarily always, but there's great potential for unusual punishment to be abused. Unusual by its very definition implies it has not been tried very often. If it was tried often, it would be usual. Therefore, we do not have a clear understanding of its effect. We're not sure if it's fully cruel or not. It also makes sure there's consistency. Judges cannot randomly throw out some punishment because they feel like punishment has to be within our consistent practice. The Ninth Amendment reserves whatever rights are not explicitly given to the government to us, the people. Tenth Amendment guarantees whatever rights are not given to the people and the federal government to the state, respectively. 2003, I came into a situation which involved at least four amendments. The First Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, and the Sixth Amendment. This situation of mine illustrates both how these can be violated, also how they can be exercised in a fair. On June 4, 2003, I went to protest Joseph Flicker's shop. I understand clearly what my legal limits are, what I can do. Thus, I sought to stay within the law. I sought to obey the law, to exercise my rights. One would think you would not be arrested. You would not be cited. It would all be okay. But no, such was not the case. I have talked about this event at length on other occasions. Tonight, I would like to focus more specifically how this event pertains to our Bill of Rights. The shop owner did not like what I was doing. Therefore, they were so stupid to think the police officers the law had the right to stop me from peacefully and orderly protesting there. Stop. The cops came. I did not say a word to the cops. In fact, I was silent. They did not like this at all. But as Noel Press said, you do not have to say a word to cops. It's your right. I exercise that right. The cops did not like the fact I was not responding to them. Even they know we have the First Amendment. They can't arrest me for speaking out against Joseph Licker. What they can do is find some way around it. So 
officers were standing there throwing out possibilities. You can get it for not having a permit, vagrancy, obstruction of justice. It's all we could do. They wanted me to identify myself. I chose not to do so. I don't have to. The one officer picked up my back. I grabbed it too. We struggled for a second. He said, you do not want to get in this. I still held on. He said, let go. Since I do not want a billy club or any other device used on me, I decided it was prudent to let go. Noel Press said, if the police officers insist upon searching you, even if you make it clear you do not consent to the search, allow them to do so, but make it even more clear you are not consenting. They say if you try to prevent them from searching, there can be a big mess. He went through my bag. There was nothing in there that would interest him. A notebook he went through. And as he was doing this, I yelled, I do not consent to this search. I do not consent to this search. Fourth Amendment right was violated out there. When he took my bag, when he started searching, I said, do you have a search warrant? He said, I don't need a search warrant. That was caught on tape. He thinks he's above the law. He does not have to follow the Bill of Rights. He doesn't like it. Move to North Korea, Larry Krebs. Remember that name. If you're in Mankato, he's a bad one to watch out for. Ultimately, they arrested me. They took me to a police station. They eventually released me, telling me not to go back there. My First Amendment right was violated. I was charged with disorderly conduct. I started researching disorderly conduct. I knew what I was doing was, was within the law. The question was, were they going to lie about it? Fortunately, I did not have to fight that battle. They were relatively truthful later. You may think, see, police officers are truthful. I wonder if this is good. It demonstrates violating one's Fourth Amendment rights. One does not have to hide it. They're not ashamed of doing it. To me, it's very shameful to violate the Bill of Rights. Something, someone who was happily civil may want to hide, but they did not. I realized what I wanted to do was defend myself, assert my right to a trial, inspired by my friend Jeff Decker. Thus, the first hearing, I demanded by right to a jury trial. The prosecutor tried to heavy-handedly get me to confess. I did it. The charge would be dropped down. Police officers got me for a misdemeanor. She said, if you plead guilty to a petty misdemeanor, no trial, we'll mark you down for that. What I found out, something very scary, if you plead guilty at your arraignment before ever talking to a prosecutor, they will not even look at your file. They'll just send it straight to the probation people. Thus, even if you eventually, plus even if you 
want to plead guilty, I highly recommend waiting. If you plead guilty right away, you do not get your foot in the door. You plead not guilty once, then the bargaining process starts. Likely they will want to get you for a lesser charge. If you're guilty or aware of being guilty, 